Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to another episode of Catholic Chat. Joining me today, I've got a very special guest, Dr. David Clayton. He is the provost of Pontifex University, uh, the premier, one of the premier Catholic online universities. He's an artist, writer, teacher, grew up in England, graduated from Oxford, and specializes in uh, studying beauty. It's great to have you today, Dr. Clayton. It's great to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, of course. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was uh, your primary role, Provost of Pontifex University. Now, could you tell us a little bit about uh, what exactly Pontifex University is? Yes, yeah, so we're a, um, a, a fairly new university. About, uh, I started four and a half years ago. It, actually, it will be five years in October. Um, and I was the first full-time employee and um, it's an online university that is faithful to the magisterium of the Catholic Church. Uh, we're actually canonically Catholic. Um, the people that fund this are part of a, um, a, something called the Solidarity Association, which is uh, canonically part of the church, actually. Um, and we offer three programs exclusively almost exclusively online, certainly the classes that we offer. Uh, so the first is a Master of Sacred Arts, and that's what I was hired to create initially, and then manage the implementation of the program and uh, be responsible for trying to attract students, um, and then use that to, um, to leverage, if you like, to create more programs. To, and it's not just me doing this. There are lots of very good people who are working with me. So I'm not going to claim the full credit for anything. But um, that's so. That's what I did. I created the Master of Sacred Arts program. I also manage the uh, the applications of the students, and we have um, a, a Doctor of Theology program, a Theology Doctorate program, uh, which is high research, low coursework, and we have in partnership with Christopher West's Theology of the Body Institute, an MA in the Theology of the Body and the New Evangelization. So they teach some of those courses as part of their workshop. So that's, that portion is not online, but it's the degree is offered by us, uh, even, and we accredit the classes they teach. We have two real aims. One is to give quality education we're gradually going to start introducing more and more programs uh, that all of which uh, are the sort that would appeal to Catholics who are interested in their faith um, but the other one is to do so in such a way that uh, it is affordable and there is a problem in education generally at the moment I think in that the fees are escalating uh, the coursework requirements are just inflated in order to enhance those fees for classes which are very expensive anyway. And it's a Ponzi scheme. Uh, I'm talking broadly about higher education here, which I think at some point is going to collapse. And the people who foot the bill at the moment are the students who are in debt, basically. Yeah. Um, and so we're trying to find a way to uh, sidestep that um, as well. No, that's uh, that's fantastic, and you know, as someone who's you know surrounded by a lot of college uh, students all the time, uh, the rising costs are definitely a concern from a lot of us. You know, we yes. often don't really know where the money is going, uh, why it has to be so expensive, yep. why everything's inflating so much. If, if you could talk about the state of Catholic online education, because this sounds like a pretty uh, unique endeavor i haven't heard of too many institutions i, I know some larger schools yeah. uh, i think catholic university of america where i go actually offers some online mm. programs but an, an exclusively online program uh, what, what what is the state of uh, catholic online education right now well i would say it's small as you say we're not the only ones by any any stretch um and there are um a, a number of good uh, online programs and universities as as you point out most are um, from universities which also have a campus presence. Um, 
we actually have an association with a, a small liberal arts college in uh, Atlanta called Holy Spirit College. Um, but uh, what I would say is that Pontifex in itself is different in that it really is um, or unusual. It's not a unique in that it, it really is the main focus for certainly in the work that I do is online. Um, the state of the, the education, I, I would say it parallels in a way what's happening in the Catholic world of education. Um, so this is an underutilized market, the online education. I think there's plenty of room for people who are good and offer a good education. So we don't see ourselves in competition with those people. I think that there's, there's such a dearth of good places, whether it's campus or online, that offer a good Catholic education that there's, that, you know, the, there's room for us all, I would say. Um, and generally what is happening is that you have the, the um, established universities uh, who've been going for say a hundred years that might be Catholic in name and not always uh, so faithful to the magisterium. There's a lot of people who are faithful Catholics are uh, wary of those institutions. Um, and then you have uh, the rebirth of Catholic education as a response to this, which would start with a number of small independent uh, colleges. Um, I used to teach at Thomas More College and then there's Thomas in New Hampshire and Thomas Aquinas in mm. California. Yeah. Um, and uh, at the same time, within some of those larger universities, you're getting a rebirth of edu education within departments or there, there are clusters and uh, programs, great books programs, for example, uh, within some of those universities, which are re-establishing uh, the Catholic identity. But at the moment, we, we, we're, we're not out of the woods yet, is what I would say. That this, we, you know, we're not trying to discourage other people from doing what we're doing. Uh, we, we want more and more people to try this because we want good quality education to be available to Catholics, um, that people need to be able to trust that what they're getting is true, I think. Yeah, that's a fair point. As a theology major, I'm politics theology double. Uh, yeah, that's definitely you know important. It's at the point now where you can't just go to any Catholic school to study theology. There's you know mm -hmm. a, kind of a select few that are really top of the line among the big names, but then there are a lot of smaller ones that are pretty faithful to what the church actually teaches. Now you know shifting gears to a little bit of current events. Now the COVID nineteen situation certainly had its impact on you know a lot of universities across the country i mean i got dragged home from uh, dc because of it now you guys being all online how has that impacted uh, your mission and your activities have you seen an uptake in interest or uh, we we have we've seen some interest uh we're just trying to work out what the pattern of it is at the moment what i would say is we haven't seen a huge number of new enrollments Mm. Um, I don't get, the, the, we've seen some, but I don't get the sense that people are using this as a, as a chance to jump into a whole new program of online education. What we have seen is people who are now at home thinking, well, actually, I can make good use of this time. And uh, I've got nothing else. Well, I, I wouldn't say nothing else. Right. Home, but <laughs> I've got time on my hands. This was like that. I don't want to be rude about it. We've all got stuff to do. Um, and I, that's I consistent <laughs> really with the profile of our students who tend to be not uh, like yourself, people who I'm guessing that you left high school and went to right. university. Okay, so we'd love to have students like that, but our um, programs tend to appeal uh, to maturer students who are trying to fit it in with a, sh um, a, a schedule that includes family life, uh, work life as well. Um, and so uh, we make it easy for people to do it class by class and work at their own pace and according to their own uh, schedule. Um, that means that now that they've got more time, uh, they're becoming more focused on doing this and trying to make use of the time usefully. Um, and so they buy the classes as they take them. And so we're seeing um, 
uh, an uptake in revenue, which is nice. Um, and, and also, I'm getting lovely emails actually from students. So, uh, one of the negatives of online education is this sense of distance between the students and the teachers. And we're trying to work out ways of building up community. Um, we, you know, we create student forums and encourage the students to contact the teachers and ask questions directly. So I'm always getting emails and this sort of thing. Um, and I'm getting just beautiful letters really from the students saying that they appreciate very much that our courses are there and that they can focus on uh, learning about their faith and about Catholic culture um, in this time, which otherwise um, is not the most cheerful of periods in our history. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, I appreciate you uh, answering that. And, you know, along those lines, you were starting to talk a little bit about the profile of the type of students who attend Pontifex University. And, you know, before we move into talking about uh, the blog, uh, I'd like to ask, you know, for a lot of people who might be seeing this, uh, it's a lot of young people who you know, mm. watch this channel. Who, what exactly is the profile of someone who would be interested in something like Pontifex University? Okay. So um, all, our programs are uh, graduate programs at the moment. In principle, we'll, we'll go on to undergraduate. So uh, we do a, a master's in theological studies, which is a, a, a theology master's, and that represents the coursework for a, the theology doctorate. And so um, we do get people wishing who have, um, have come, have done a first degree and then um, usually they don't go straight to us. They, they have some time out and think about it. They've got to pay back some of the, the, uh, the debt that they've created. But when they're in a position to think about moving on, then we start to see people. Now that can be quite, you know, that can be people in their twenties. Um, it's not, it's not just retirees, although we have plenty of retirees as well. Um, so uh, that's that's really the uh, the characteristic that I notice. Um, one thing that's uh, very interesting is that the uh, people are are very interested in the uh, theology of the body and the new evangelization yeah and especially of course christopher west's presentation of it uh, we're excited to be partnering with them christopher has a gift i think for communicating difficult um, and rather dry and abstract principles in an entertaining way and a way that people understand it and um and so uh there's he will attract people from all sorts of backgrounds because people are so drawn to the material. And of course, there's great love uh, for John Paul II, who is at the, the core of this master's, which is really a, a, um, about uh, the work of John Paul II, mainly the theology of the body, but not only. It's, it's really about his life and his writing and his world view. Um, so we... Uh, but our, our students will have a degree. Um, they usually have worked some period and now they want, they're, they're thirsting for um, intellectual stimulation. They're thirsting to know more about their faith and to get into it deeper. And so that can happen at different stages in life for different people, I would say, but that, that, that tends to be the characteristic. They're, they're committed people who want to learn and want to learn about the faith. Well, that's amazing. You know, um, having run the Clarifying Catholicism project, uh, you know, we've mostly focused on a lot of young people, uh, high school and college students. We, we started off way back in high school. And, you know, one of the things we've uh, really looked into and are uh, moving into doing is to continue to foster our engagement with the faith beyond college. Um, and, you know, as we all move into the workforce, that's going to be a bit more difficult for, you know, mm. a, a lot of us. So it, it is great to know that there's institutions, especially online, that are rising to meet that yearning and craving, showing adults that they really can engage with their 
faith yes. like that. Uh, that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. One little thing that, that I would add, actually, is that our uh, doctoral program, our theology doctorate, what the, the profile of student we had in mind, um, and a, a proportion of our students do follow this, um, is priests who are parish priests who are happy doing what they're doing mm -hmm. and have an STL, um, so a licentiate, mm -hmm. um, and are not in a position to go on and do further study and do a doctorate, and perhaps they don't want to anyway. They're, they've, they're in the, doing their calling, they're following the, their calling, but they, they would like to be reconnected with the academic world and yeah. do some research. And so priests who are in that position can fit uh, this uh, doctorate around their current work and they would be exempt all the, the coursework material. So we accept the STL as constituting the necessary coursework and they would then go straight to the production of a thesis. And this is not an easy option. We expect rigor and it's a, a 50,000 word thesis. It's a, a, a big research project. And this is more like what's doing a, a, a doctorate would be, for example, in the UK, where I come from, where the, the driving impetus, if you like, is the production of original research. Yeah. If you have to do classwork, it, it's really just to enable the research to be better. It's not done just as a, um, as a sort of arbitrary hoops to jump through. Mm. Um, so, and, and we are finding great appreciation actually from priests who are who are taking this up and, and again very reasonably priced I would say within the budget of most priests. Yeah. Well that's great to know you know uh, personally I, I just uh, finished reading a paper by uh, Father uh, Piet Franson uh, from the 1960s he wrote a lot of commentaries on systematic theology and the impact of uh, Vatican II and one of the things he uh, noticed was this tendency that a lot of priests in the modern era are moving further and further away from core theological study, that it, it's very pastoral. I mean, it has to be because of the amount of tasks they have in front of them. So I'm very glad you brought up this, you know, th that you're supporting priests who kind of want to continue engaging with the intellectual theological yeah. core of the faith, because in, in many ways, because of uh, how how swamped our priests are these days it, it's often difficult for them to continue along that path so definitely yes. glad you mentioned that now moving to the uh blog uh, the way of beauty could you uh, speak a little bit about uh that project uh, yes. it's fascinating for sure you know okay <laughs> <clears throat> so there's a couple of things going on first of all the the pontifex website is all the w's pontifex.university um, but we have also what uh, really constitutes a, a magazine on Catholic faith and culture, which is something that I've been working on for over 10 years now called the way of beauty.org. So this predates Pontifex or my association with them. And it, it's, I just began writing and um, I've recently started a podcast um, in which we discuss and write about all aspects of Catholic culture. And given that Catholicism can touch every aspect of life, it gives me free range to talk about anything that interests me. Exactly, that's um, great. <laughs> so it's, it, uh, we have also another, so it's myself, and then another blogger, uh, Deacon Lawrence Klemecki, who is a graduate of Pontifex University's Master of Sacred Arts program, and is an artist, he's, a, he's based in uh, the Diocese of Sacramento, I, I think, here in California, anyway. Um, and so uh, the, the idea is that this is a forum that um, allows me to develop ideas. I, get, I have quite a lot of original material, I get free reign to write that, but, but will also attract people in who aren't necessarily interested in doing courses, but just want to discuss and think about Catholic culture. And I that what strikes me is that there is a, a strong sense among Catholics that the culture has gone wrong and that Catholicism ought to be filling the vacuum and isn't. And really that's, it's how can we reestablish a culture of beauty as Catholics 
is the broad question that I'm trying to answer with everything that I do with that. So it, it considers everything from art in the context of the liturgy and the, the arts right in the church, but then also how uh, those inform and are informed by uh, a secular culture, a, a culture that isn't specifically Catholic. Right. And in the ideal, um, everything begins with the worship of God in the liturgy and on a flood tide of grace, if you like, we carry out uh, that vision uh, from the church into our daily lives, which in turn draws people back into the church where we came from and then reinforces it again and, and it informs it. Um, and so uh, I'm always thinking about how uh, the liturgical forms speak to and uh, connect with uh, the non-liturgical because as Catholics that's what we have to try and do um, so in a very uh, and, and also how popular we tend to have this divergence I think of popular culture and high culture right which right. just simply never existed in the past yeah um, and really the, the problem here is that we have um, people who's the culture has become a university uh subject people are studying it and talking about it and it's, it's feeding on itself but actually it's it's a bubble which has broken away from what culture really ought to be which is noble and accessible to ordinary people it's what people the culture is the pattern of living of ordinary people and if those people are noble and virtuous and you don't need to be a high intellectual to be noble and virtuous. And in fact, some would argue that it mitigates against it. But if that pattern, if that's what the, the, the way that people lead their lives, that culture will be the highest that we can have. Um, and uh, so that is the vision really, which I'm trying to promote with the way of beauty. Mm. And uh, you mentioned a podcast. Uh, could you, uh, what, what's the name of that again? So we can. Yes, but incidentally, I want to put this in my podcast. I'll talk to you about that afterwards. Oh, sure. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but both the podcast and the blog are at thewayofbeauty.org. Okay. Um, and then they, the podcasts are recorded like this, a Zoom video. So it's video and audio. Um, and they're also posted on a Way of Beauty YouTube channel. And so that's where you can see them. And I think through that, I, I, I don't know how to do this, but you can get it. It's on, we're on iTunes, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I actually edit a few podcasts for different organizations. So yeah, I, you can sync them all up and everything. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. Dolly who dies to works with me, has, sorts all that stuff out. So. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, it, it sounds like an incredible uh, mission for sure. You know, I, I personally, I did a lot of uh, studying of the philosophy of art over in uh, Rome because, you know, Catholic University of America has a campus over there. Probably one of the most spectacular places to study aesthetics, beauty, history of art, yeah. etc. cetera. Um, but, you know, regarding the subject of beauty, and you know, I guess, I suppose this is me asking you from a bit of an academic perspective, there are a lot of different visions for what we should recognize as beautiful. And you, you started to mention that it should start in the liturgy. Could you possibly elaborate a little bit on how yes. beauty found in the liturgy should permeate outward throughout the rest of our lives? Okay, so that's that's... A we could do a whole lecture series on, on that. <laughs> um, so let's start with uh, beauty first, and then I'll I'll come back to the liturgy, uh, and I'll try and keep this. I'll try and do a Christopher West and make this understandable I, <laughs> and uh, accessible. I, I'll do my best. I, I'm not him, but I'll, I'll try. Okay. So beauty is a property of what we look at. So if I see a beautiful painting. And this is the traditional uh, Catholic belief. It's not a dogma, so you can be a Catholic and have other views. But traditionally, this is what uh, Catholics have believed and have felt. I don't know if I use that word or have held to. So it's a property of the, the thing that we see. Um, that, and so that means it's an objective quality. And so if you and I disagree on whether something is beautiful, 
uh, either one of us is right, uh, or one of us is right and one of right. us is wrong. Yeah. Um, or we're both wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, but the, but the difficulty with that proposition, which I believe, and the, the evidence for that, for me, the strongest argument is the beauty of the cosmos. I, I don't know anybody who dissents from the idea, even the most hardened atheist, I think, that the natural world is beautiful. Yeah. And however they talk about it, if they haven't studied philosophy at a university yet and had this persuaded out of them, they will talk about it as though it's what they're looking at is beautiful and there is a personal response. Okay. Yeah. Now, the difficulty is that when we look at the culture of man, which can be modelled uh, on the beauty of the cosmos, that's what the ancients believed, and they looked yep. for patterns and rhythms that they then could then reproduce in their architecture and art, um, that if you and I disagree, ha we haven't got an arbiter who can decide who's right and who's wrong. And we know that there are differences of opinion. Um, and so that is the strongest argument for the subjectivity of beauty. Right. Um, and it, it's difficult to persuade people otherwise. Now, the argument I would use is that both of these aspects are present. And it's like science. There is an order, uh, as in modern, the modern understanding of natural science, we say. There is an order which um, permeates through the, the laws of physics, for example. Mm -hmm. um, now, we believe that, and we believe that to be true, but physicists can differ on their descriptions of that order. And they're being rational, they're looking at the data, um, but nevertheless, scientific theorems are revised and are, are developed. And so, in other words, we can be wrong. Um, now, with science, you just... Um, it, what keeps science honest is technology. If the bridge stays up or the car moves, we tend to think that the science is right. Um, if there's no technology to back it up, I, I tend to be suspicious of science. I, I did physics at Oxford, by the way, so I oh, understand wow. a little bit. I, I, or material science, the physics of solids. Um, so I, I'm suspicious when there is no validation of technology in science. Now, for beauty, how can we tell who's right and who's wrong? There, it's very difficult. And someone just said, well, I think I'm right. It's, how can you argue against that? Well, I would say that we can't. Ultimately, we don't really know. But the greatest test, I would say, is to trust in human nature and yeah. say that God made us to respond to beauty because beauty is a sign of him. Yep. And the cosmos... Um, if we follow that um, instinct directs us to the one who made it or a desire for him and if man's culture participates in that same beauty it does this it can do the same and so the best test of that it's not an infallible test is tradition in other words have many people over a long period yeah. of time said this is beautiful mm -hmm. Um, and I tend to trust in human nature. Um, a lot of people who are grounded in this idea that you need elites to decide things are suspicious of the popular view. And I say, well, I don't mean the popular view just in this present moment. That can be subject uh, to the vicissitudes of fashion and uh, yeah. PR. But over an extended period of time, something that is good and true and beautiful will tend to transcend its own time and be appreciated. Yep. Now, in regard to the liturgy, therefore, we're playing with souls. We want art or music or architecture that is in harmony with the liturgy and uh, will highlight and uh, will resonate with it so, so that we might worship God well, which is the highest activity that we can participate in as human beings. So how do we uh, deal with the art that ought to be there? I would say that we ought to be conservative and play safe, follow tradition. There is room for innovation. There is room for change. There always has to be, otherwise a tradition will die. But for the most part, we need to learn and build on what many Catholics over many centuries have felt or have believed is good for the liturgy. 
Um, and so we need to study history and be aware of it, but we don't need to be locked in history either. A, a right. tradition at the same time has to respond to the people of the day, but it has to work within the bounds of what that tradition is. That would be my approach anyway. Yep. And so there are no hard and fast rules. Um, the, but if you're looking at it in the light of what I've just said, I believe that we will tend to gravitate towards certain patterns of art and architecture and music. Now, how does that connect to the wider world? Well, the first thing to understand is that the litur liturgy is the source of its own culture. So we bring into it the culture that we belong to, certainly. And there are good aspects of that and there are bad aspects of that. And when we make art, it will reflect the fact that we are a people of our time and of our place. We can't help it. But at the same time, if we're worshipping God well and praying well in church, that is, is, the, is another source of grace which is, comes from beyond this world, which really ought to be the driving force for the liturgical culture. Um, it's a combination of the two. Now, what then happens is that we worship and uh, we pray um, with, in the context of the liturgy, we have this encounter with God uh, through the Eucharist, of course, and are transformed supernaturally, baptized Catholics that by degrees in this life towards that ideal of um, being in full union with God in heaven. Uh, we partake of the divine nature. And so when we then go out, uh, it's not something usually we're aware of ourselves, it's by degrees and incrementally, and it's not perfect, you know, but nevertheless, uh, when we go out and try to do things beautifully, gracefully, well, lovingly, virtuously, the product of our work will reflect that what we have seen in the liturgy. And so the pattern that you see historically is that, for example, in the Gothic period, you had Gothic churches. It began as a liturgical form, and then people would build civic buildings or palaces in that style appropriate to what it is it doesn't look exactly like a church but coming back to education for example if you go to the colleges of oxford and cambridge they were uh, built as educational institutions well suited for what they are but they draw on uh, the design of um, cathedral cloisters and uh, monastic institutions um, for their for the inspiration of their design and that's why they're so, they're so beautiful. Um, and that's why I would say that Oxford, as, as someone who studied <laughs> there, is perhaps one of the most beautiful cities in the world. But I am yeah. biased, I'll admit it. Right, yeah. No, <laughs> no I, I really appreciate uh, the answer there. And you know, I, I do think you put it in a great way. It can be easily understood by a lot of people. You know, in, in a lot of my personal studies on the subject of beauty, one thing... I've uh, tended to notice, and I think it's over the course of philosophy in general too, is even when mankind has tried to escape this driving force towards God, because that happened with a lot of modern philosophy, as you know, there reemerges this tendency to gravitate towards some sort of transcendental uh, value, a transcendental beauty, goodness. It might not explicitly be God in the modern sense, but there is this compulsion that, you know, makes us aware that something greater beyond just arbitrary human machination is happening. And, you know, I, I think it's important that Catholic institutions recognize that that central transcendental force is God, mm. the source of all beauty. Like well, that. I would argue that um, the, the end of Catholic education, and I'm drawing on Pius XI here, is what he refers to as the supernatural man. In other words, all that we learn is really directed towards forming us to be transformed in the context of the liturgy. Um, and the wisdom that we get from such an education 
um, is supernatural, it's divine wisdom, if you like, that, that is not presented in the classroom. Uh, um, and uh, this is forgotten, I think, even by many places that are faithful to the magisterium. That, that they see the liturgy, if you like, as something which ought to be there, but really the education takes part in the classroom. Right. And, yeah. uh, and it may be very good, but um, the, the connection between the two isn't always so obvious. And I would say that, that there's a reason why those Oxford colleges were designed in such a way as to evoke mm -hmm. uh, monastic or cathedral uh, architecture, that, because really they saw it as, part, as a participation yeah, in yeah. the same mission as a Christian. Mm -hmm. um, with the liturgy, you, know, the, the, you have these cloisters uh, that lead to the church, which is the central position uh, building in the college. Um, and they would pray the hours, they would have mass uh, regularly. Um, and so that, that's something that needs to be remembered, I think. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't want to be negative about any that are faithful to the magisterium. We, we need... Uh, you know, we, we're all striving for an ideal, let's put it like that. Yes, and yes. Uh, what, you know, those who are trying to be true to the faith, every, everyone needs encouragement to do that. So. No, of course. Yeah. And yeah, I think there's, even in psychology, a very important uh, aspect behind, uh, you know, the architecture layout, as you've been describing. I think it's very, I, I, I vividly remember, I think it was up in uh, Washington, Washington State, I was uh, visiting a college and uh, they found out uh, we were from a Catholic uh, high school and they said, oh, well, our temple is the library. I'm like thinking, you know, that, thank, th thanks, first of all, for just bluntly saying that, to her, but there is, it's very different to say the library is the center versus the yeah. church is the center. So I, I definitely appreciate your yeah. comments there because it's something that's and, lost today. Uh, the, the great books programs um, that we see that, that tend to be part of American education, they're always fighting to sort of re-establish themselves and you know being eaten away, but actually it's a relatively new phenomenon and it's that it began in the 20th century I think with St John's Annapolis and uh, or should we say was re-established uh, on an idea of what they felt education ought to be. Um, but it is secular, actually. It's, <laughs> and Catholics have adopted this and adapted it. And, and it, But it, it's always assumed that that should be the basis of a Catholic education. Um, now, it can be, but not if there's a gaping hole in the middle, which is scripture and the worship of God mm -hmm. and the understanding of the, the basics of the faith. That, that's that's a Catholic education yeah um, and the goal of the educators for whatever else they give us even if it's academic or vocational uh, should we say um, it, it has to be understood in the context of that yeah no, that, that's very insightful and I appreciate the elaboration on all these points now before we close things off are there any resources regarding the subject of beauty and especially beauty and uh, the faith or beauty in God that you would recommend any listeners uh, who don't have much experience with these subjects to look into? Um, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll recommend my own work. Uh, All right. <laughs> and, uh, so I, th there is an aspect of self-promotion in this, I will freely admit. But uh, what I would say is that what drove me to produce this material was that uh, I, want, I just wanted to paint, I wanted to be an artist, um, mm -hmm. and I wanted to learn about it, and I couldn't find anything at all that satisfied me um, as an artist. I would, I would see, I would read books on aesthetics, but they, I didn't think they made sense, actually. I thought they were poor, and certainly didn't help somebody who was interested in being an artist. So what I started to do was do research on how artists in the past were trained and uh, not just the practical element of that was part of it. In the end, that turned out to be the easiest aspect to get trained, uh, even though it's difficult relatively. Um, what is even more difficult to find is the spiritual formation, the intellectual formation and the, the way that artists were enculturated 
to work within certain forms that would that, that could become natural to them um, and so as well as trying to apply that to myself as an artist i then started to write about it this this is began with the the, the way of beauty.org blog um, and then i pulled a lot of that information together in a book called the way of beauty mm. which is published by angelico press um, and what happened is that um, I wanted to make the argument that the, it, this is a formation which engenders creativity and openness to inspiration. Uh, we can't guarantee that, but it's, uh, it, should we say, developing that faculty within us in some way. Um, stimulating us, let's put it like that. So ultimately, it's down to us and whether God chooses to inspire us, of course. But... Um, if, that's, if there is an assumption that there is such an education, then this is something that should be available to everybody because who doesn't want to be creative? Who doesn't want to be inspired? Whatever they're doing, it doesn't, the, the um, creative pursuit of art um, could, it, um, of course, benefits from this, but it could, an accountant would like to be creative in what they do in many ways, I imagine. Um, so I made the argument in that book that this should be part of a general Catholic education and started to investigate um, the, uh, the traditional writings on education that the church had produced. And what I discovered is that what it was describing was exactly what had been given to artists. And for the most part, aside from their skill, the, the particular skill, their general education was just a Catholic education. Um, and so I wrote this book in order to persuade educators to consider a formation in beauty as an integral part of, uh, of, of what people should be taught uh, and the formation they should be given. Um, it was actually when that book was published that Pontifex approached me and said, we'd like you to create a program based on that book. So that's how that's happened. That's wonderful. And as far as the art that you've created, is there any, is it can also be found on the Way of Beauty's uh, website? Uh, to a degree. Um, the, the funny thing is, although I started off wanting to be an artist, and I even came to the US, um, first of all, about 12 years ago, as artist in residence at Thomas More College of Liberal Arts in New York. Oh, wow. I'm sure a lot of my art is hanging in the chapel there still. I've never pushed myself as an, art, as an artist. I, what happened is that I, I always thought, well, I'll come back to that. Um, I think that the greater need is for, to, for people to find out about how artists are formed because I want to see more artists. Um, but in regard to my own art, I, I'm trained as uh, an iconographer I'm also trained in the academic method. I learned portrait painting in Florence. Mm. And there is some of that on my uh, blog. Yes, the way of beauty.org. There's a gallery there, although I don't keep it very up to date. If you want to buy a book called The Little Oratory, which is about creating an icon corner um, in your home, which I co-wrote with someone called Lila Lawler, there are, there are about a dozen uh, color plates in that which can be detached and they're made at, at a standard size so they fit the sort of frames you might buy in a in a shop you know in a home base or something uh, so you could start there and get a, um, an icon corner um, and then also I have lots of line drawings in that as well uh, so if people wish to see my art that, that's where they can go. Great well thank you very much uh, you know for letting us know so much about Pontifex, Catholic online education, uh, beauty itself. I think we covered a lot of great ground in this interview today. So I appreciate you very much for taking the time to come on this uh, uh, video and, you know, uh, let us know. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we uh, close off the interview? <laughs> well, I'll just tell you my motto, okay, which is, that if I think I can do something at least as badly as anybody else, I might as well do it myself. So <laughs> uh, I would encourage, it, it needs us to go out and start doing it, frankly. 
Yeah. It, I'm building on Chesterton, who said, if a thing's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not pro proposing low standards. What I'm saying is, we've got to do something, we yeah. do our best. And with God's grace and uh, inspiration and faith, our best can be better than anything else. Mm. Really cool. can. Action is always better than potency, for sure, in the <laughs> metaphysical sense there. So thank you uh, once again so much for uh, coming on. Uh, and thank you very much for uh, watching uh, another episode of Catholic Chat. We wish all of you a fantastic week. If there's anyone that any of you viewers recommend uh, we reach out to to feature, please let us know in the comments below. Have a great day. God bless you. And thank you, sir.